Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to the implications of recent data sets for the management of hepatocellular carcinoma. And in particular today, we're going to be focusing on some recent data presented both at the ASCO meeting and the ESMO uh, GI meeting as well. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Ghassan Abu Alpha from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, and Dr. Denang Lee from the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in Duarte, uh, California. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time today. As we do in all our webinars, we get put out a one minute pre and post meeting survey. If you take that, you'll get a little more out of the meeting. We'll learn a little bit about you. If you're into audio programs, check out our Oncology Today podcast series, including a recent program with Professor Vogel focusing on HCC. We do webinars all the time. Next Monday, we're doing a really interesting one on high-risk localized prostate cancer and new data coming out on intensification of hormonal therapy and even hormonal therapy without ADT. Then on Wednesday, August the 2nd, next week, we'll be doing a program on bispecific antibodies in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, particularly follicular lymphoma and diffuse large B cells. Such an exciting area. And then on Tuesday, August the 8th, we'll talk about the management of metastatic pancreatic cancer. We have uh, Dr. Abu Alpha's uh, colleague, Dr. O'Reilly and Dr. Weinberg to talk about that. And then on Thursday, August the 10th, we'll be meeting with uh, Professor Long from Australia to talk about the management of melanoma. So many amazing things going on there, I can barely keep track of it. But today we're here to talk about HCC and particularly some of the data that was just presented at uh, ASCO and the ESMO uh, GI meeting. And we're going to approach this a little bit differently. Uh, we don't usually have presentations as our webinar, but today we're going to do that. Uh, so we're going to start out in a minute with a presentation where Ghassan is going to review uh, uh, first-line data, again, particularly some of the data that was just presented in the last couple of months. And then Dr. Den uh, Dr. Lee will talk about later-line therapy, but also adjuvant therapy, a really interesting area. We'll see where that's uh, heading. But uh, before we get started, I want to just sort of warm up a little bit and bring up a topic that I just find really interesting. And I'm going to start with you, Dan. And that's this issue, uh, you know, of the etiology of uh, HCC and response to immunotherapy. You know, I was always expecting that viral-related illnesses were going to lead to higher response rates. We didn't really see that in head and neck cancer and even cervical cancer. Uh, what's your, but, you know, we hear a little bit about it. You know, some data has come out, you know, maybe suggesting that people with NASH or non-viral HCC don't respond quite as well. Just kind of curious, Dan, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think the data is, you know, has been somewhat mixed and everything because uh, most of the data so far has been really on uh, subgroup analyses. And uh, a lot of times when you look at subgroup analyses, these are very small number of patients, right, on which to draw longer term conclusions. And I don't think that we should, you know, probably do that. Uh, you know, I, I will say that, uh, you know, certainly uh, in clinical practice and what we're seeing, uh, uh, patients that have had NASH and everything, we, we still have seen, you know, uh, responders uh, to uh, immunotherapy. Um, so, so, you know, it, it, certainly in my practice, uh, outside of definitive data, uh, I wouldn't necessarily make the decision of whether or not to offer a patient uh, immunotherapy uh, just based off of the ideology of the disease at this point in time. I think we still give them what is our best available treatments so that we give them the best chance, you know, for a response going forward. Any thoughts on this, Kassan, uh, and also leads into the whole issue of predicting benefit from immunotherapy and checkpoint inhibitors, which of course is generally you know, been a little bit rocky. We have PD-1 out there, that doesn't always work out. TMB hasn't always worked out. Uh, any thoughts about predictors in general on whether it's anything you've seen in HCC, uh, including etiology, Kassan? Well, thanks for, thanks for having us again, Neil. And uh, the first part of your question, I'll take you historically to Snorri Thor Garrison, superb hepatologist who was at the NCI. And if anything, his teaching point was for all of us that 
HCC is a group of different diseases. What's Hep B, what's Hep C, what's NASH, what's alcohol are two different, are totally different diseases. And they try to dissect it based on the genetic makeup of the tumor. And for example, we know very well, for example, that the uh, RAFRAS kinase pathway is maybe Hep C. Maybe hyper hypomethylation is more NASH, uh, correction, more, more uh, alcoholic liver disease, etc. However, uh, at some point in time, uh, when we start understanding the disease better, uh, we understood that probably, yes, there are nuances and differences, but to be fair, we don't understand them fully. What you're referring to is a paper that came out uh, in Nature by Dave Fister, superb pa paper, which is, again, I start by saying it was a preclinical basic research paper. Dr. Fister took the initiative to say, okay, let me see what's in the what's in the literature. I look at that data and see if really it makes sense what I did. And I have to say, erroneously, many of us read that data and said, oh yeah, I should not give any more uh, the checkpoint inhibitors to patients with NASH. No, this is not what Dr. Fister told us to do. If anything, he was trying to explain or find out why the patient with Hep B specific will fare set well in regard to the checkpoint inhibitors. He even described, he said, there's clearly some form of CD8 cells, and he called them exhausted CDAs that probably aren't contributing to this. And to be fair, he actually, quote unquote, said, we don't know what those exit CD8s are. We, don't, we couldn't define it at the time of that paper publication. So this is where we are. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Lee, and Dan is right. We give the therapy for everybody, independent, irrespective of their of their etiology of the disease. But will the future uh, take us somewhere else? Yes, it can. It will probably be multifactorial. I don't think it's going to be only the etiology. There will be other factors part of it. This is probably work that we're doing currently at Stone Catering for across the world, collecting tissue samples, collecting demographic data, and try to analyze what are the pinning down component that will tell us how to treat. So we hopefully will move HCC from percent chance response to 100% response chance based on a specific makeup of the tumor. So I was telling both of you that we have such a great chat room. I never know where things are going to head. And already I'm starting to see some really cool questions in here. So uh, uh, Dan, uh, uh, Dr. Rudolph in the chat room so, is asking about giving immunotherapy to a patient who has active untreated hepatitis. So I, I don't know how often, I imagine it's not a, a rare for you to sh have a patient show up with HCC who had not previously been known to have uh, hepatitis. How do you manage that situation? And what about her question about the way checkpoint inhibitors affected, if any? Yeah, excellent question by Dr. Rudolph. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, for us, it really depends on uh, what is the uh, ideology of the hepatitis. Uh, and, and you can certainly see that from the original clinical trials in terms of how they mandated uh, treatment, uh, certainly for hepatitis B. Uh, and then for patients that had hepatitis C, they could have you know, active hepatitis C, uh, and they were still eligible for the frontline trials uh, that led to FDA approvals. Uh, so for patients that have hepatitis C, I have no problem treating them, even if they had no prior treatment in terms of their hepatitis C, assuming that their liver function overall is good and is well controlled and it is appropriate for treatment. Uh, and for hepatitis B patients, we will always, you know, start the antiviral uh, therapy. And uh, as a result of that, their viral loads can actually decrease very quickly. Usually, once you start uh, the hepatitis B medications, their viral loads oftentimes can go down, you know, three or four log levels within two weeks. Uh, so, so that's not a problem, you know, for us then to initiate the uh, frontline treatments that we have for HCC. Hassan, any thoughts? No, I totally concur. And by all means, I would say for Hep B, it's very important to treat the patients. And uh, if anything, because we don't do, we don't want to flare the Hep B, and by all means, we'll carry on with the treatment. But at the same time, yes, we can start therapy at the same time. In regard to the Hep C, I always I say the cats are out of the bag. And in other words, you really, it's already damaged liver. It's not anymore about the virus, it's really about the damaged liver per se. And as such, the hep C is just a bystander, sadly, at this point in time, would not necessarily worry about it much. So we're heading into uh, Ghassan's talk on first-line therapy and being the PI, the Himalaya study, we can understand his excitement about that. And we've had a number of conversations over the last uh, couple of years about first-line therapy have been pretty interesting. 
Uh, but Dan, there's a case uh, in the chat room that's very interesting. I'm curious how you would process this. This is from Dr. Kumar, part of the Florida Cancer Specialist, who has a patient who has had two of his varices banded, no diffuse gastritis, qualifies for a Tezobev, but drinks six beers a day on Saturday and Sunday. Is this amount of, if, that, of course, that's what the patient says, but in any event, is this amount of alcohol consumption by itself a relative contraindication, given you have the alternative of the stride regimen? Any thoughts about uh, this uh, case? I never thought about the issue of alcohol consumption. Any thoughts, Dan? Uh, not uh, absolute contraindication, I would say, uh, you know, to a Tezobev uh, treatment. Uh, I think there's a couple of points here, you know, for, for Dr. Kumar. I think one is that, you know, given the fact that they had varices that were banded, uh, you know, what is the access to have, you know, follow-up EGDs to have monitoring? Uh, just remember, uh, with uh, Embry 150, the treatment for varices was per institutional standard. Uh, so depending on where you are, you could have more vigilant practices to, you know, hopefully prevent those episodes of bleeding or catching them on relatively early, and certainly we do that. We, we usually have, you know, serial follow-up EGDs uh, for, for these patients that got banding and everything because we want to be watching those, you know, v very carefully. The second point is really regarding the alcohol. We've certainly treated patients that have, uh, you know, had continued alcohol use. And I, I would tell you that, you know, for, from my experience, it's really been to, you know, ask them to really cut down because, you know, unfortunately for those patients, I've had many of those patients that have had great or exceptional responses to their treatment, you know, from atezolbev and everything. And ultimately, they passed away as a result of their underlying cirrhosis from that continued alcohol use. So I would say, you know, really be vigilant and talk to those patients uh, because, you know, certainly we can control the cancer and everything, uh, but but we can't necessarily you know, have an impact on that alcoholic cirrhosis if they continue to, you know, consume alcohol on a significant basis. Certainly could offer therapy for alcoholism. I, I definitely want to ask you, uh, cause I'm, yeah. but first I want to just clarify, most likely, Dan, if a patient like this presented to you, what would they end up receiving? Uh, so, first you line. know, we would, we, yeah, we, we would say, say like, you know, still to cut down and uh, assuming that the varices are going to be controlled and can be closely monitored, we would still give them a Tezopev. So, yeah, Gassan, sometimes I wonder what would have happened if Himalaya came out two years before uh, in Brave. But any thoughts about this case and uh, Dan's thoughts about it? Sure. Yeah, I'll answer the two parts, uh, Neil. Number one, I would like to really stress out, though, I would say that the issue of alcohol has to be taken way more seriously in regard to HCC. And in other words, it's not like cut down. It's actually stop alcohol altogether. To be fair, we know this is not something that people can do on their own. But if anything, they have to really be engaged in regard to AA activity or a psychiatrist to help them not wind down to zero. Because you don't want ever that the cirrhosis get into the driver's seat and the liver cancer is in the back seat. If anything, you want always the cancer to be in the front seat and the driver's seat. And unfortunately, when the cirrhosis hits on, you cannot really say that, oh, yeah, we succeeded. We kind of, you know, shrank the tumor, but the patient died because of cirrhosis. Still, it's a failure. So we have to be very careful and explain to patients that alcohol is a damaging effect to the liver. And the fact that you're living on a margin of liver activity, alcohol has to be totally stopped. With this said, in regard to what if the Dervatrami came before the uh, at Yuzubev. By all means, you know, there's always like what's called a first comer advantage. And and totally understand and respect like why our colleagues will appreciate the uh, at Yuzubev plus Bevzumab, which to be fair is a very appropriate therapy. However, I hope that we'll be able to read into the data, not only to simply say a number which is higher, it means it's better. If you, if I tell you I have Neil this car, I'm selling it for one thousand bucks. Would you buy? I think you're gonna ask me, what are you selling me? If it was a BMW, you'll you'll just grab it in five seconds. If it's brand new, but I want to get rid of it, you'd say it. Okay, I'll take it. But if I'm giving you a piece of junk that really is like just piece of metal that looks like a car, you tell me, have a nice day. And that's exactly what we need. We need to know the demographics. We need to know what are we selling before, or what whom are we treating before we come to the conclusion. So numbers by themselves, regard survival, does not really tell the whole story. 
So uh, Dr. Kumar in the chat room thanks you and says this is very useful. Just one more thing before we get to the data and let Kassan go through that. Purely the new data was just presented. I'm just kind of curious, Dan, what is it that gets you? It seems like, you know, a lot of people uh, nowadays, you seem to have kind of a preference for Tezobev. What's the, if you had to pick one reason, is it, do you think it's more effective? You think it's safer or you're more used to it? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Abwafa and everything. As, as Kassan, you know, hi highlighted, uh, you know, there is that advantage uh, in terms of, you know, first to market because I think, uh, you know, our colleagues in the community, as a result of that, uh, they garner that early experience, right? And that experience, if they have a positive experience, then that's going to enforce them to continue to use the agent. Um, you know, I think, you know, ultimately additional research will tell us, you know, hopefully uh, as we continue to build on both of these, you know, backbones in the future, hopefully, uh, you know, what is the ideal patient population for each one respectively? Uh, and, and I think that's going to be absolutely key because we know that there's going to be somewhat differences, right? You know, certainly like, you know, the, the, the advantages of a Tezobev is that, uh, you know, for someone that, you know, may have a little bit more symptomatic burden of the disease, the VEGF uh, impact can be much quicker compared to the IO impact in terms of setting in with dual checkpoint inhibition. So, 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 you know, I think these are the things that we will continue to learn and everything, but there's no question that, you know, when people have more experience and everything, they have positive experiences, that's going to reshore them and everything. And as a result of that, they're going to most likely use it, you know, more often. That's a great point, though, in terms of combinations. Could, it could be two, three years from now, it's going to be the combination, that, the triplet or even more that you, may, you might prefer. Uh, you know, I wonder, too, Gasan, whether or not uh, the stride resumen, you know, talking about prior experience, I kind of wonder whether people's prior experience with anti-CTLA-4, PD-1, i.e. ipi nevo kind of colors their response or their thoughts. First, as soon as they see it, they start thinking about toxicity. But yet the way stride was done was not the same thing as it being even by any means. So I think that's a good lead into your talk. Uh, and uh, we'll let you go ahead and get started. And particularly you're interested to hear about the recent data. Thank you so much, Neil. And I definitely do concur with you that, yes, the epinevo did not really kind of set up a nice prelude in regard to dervatremi, but your absolute right is a totally different story over here. With this, we're going to just talk about a couple of things. And number one, of course, let's talk with the Himalaya, because this is what I was asked to. And the Himalaya, same like any other study, no difference at all. Patients with advanced unresectable hepatocellular carcinoma, good liver performance, i.e. child pew score A, regardless of the etiology, with good performance status, they were eligible to go on the study. The study did stratify patients on the, based on the etiology. Makes sense to understand from that perspective. And of course, on the maxillary vascular invasion, like any other study, as well as the performance status. The study had originally four arms, but it was actually brought into three because of the following. The comparator is sorafdib, that's easy. The primary arm is actually the stride regimen itself, which is one dose, literally one dose of termlumab only, plus dervalumab once on every month. The other arm is dervalumab alone, single agent anti-PDL1. And the third arm was actually the tremlumab, 75 milligram at one quarter of the dose, but will give in four times and followed by the um, uh, continuation of the dervalumab. Interestingly, uh, that arm was stopped because based on the AZ22 study, we found out that it was equivalent dervalumab as single agent and such it was discontinued. And that's why we carried on with the three other arms. This study is the largest study ever still for liver cancer, close to 1,200 patients. And the primary one was survival for comparing the stride, tremilumab plus dervalumab compared to sorafenib. There was another objective looking for non-inferiority for dervalumab compared to sorafenib. What did we find out? If anything, this is now updated data. This is not what you saw originally in the New England Journal of Medicine um, uh, evidence. This is actually a new evident data that we just reported, as Dr. Love mentioned, at the ESMO World GI meeting in Barcelona. Now we're looking at four-year update of overall survival. You can see that still, of course, the median survival is presently is still positive. 
in favor of the stride or the durval terminal app 16.4 months compared to roughly 13.8 months but as we know two important components did we have early responses absolutely the earliest response was actually barely two months this is how fast it was so this is really kind of you know not only in regard to anti it can happen it was also anti cla 4 but more importantly did we have Responses that continued to evolve over time, yes, we did. And as you can see, the separation of the two curves carried on from 18 to 24 to 36 to 48 months, enough that by four years, 25% of the patients on this tried regimen are still alive. That's really the important new advent data, and this compared to only 15% on the sorafenib. For the dervalumab arm, it was the same thing. We saw the separation, but remember, this was done for non-inferiority. This is a comparison of so roughly to say they are equal. And this actually is important for two important components to show, yes, it is non-inferior, but the important other conclusion, it proves again one more time, as we can see, barely that much difference between the derva at 19.3 months at 40 years compared to 15.1 for the sorafenib. Yes, that tramidose that we gave in the beginning still has its effect even for after four years. And it's very important not to undermine it saying, no, I don't need it. It's very critical to give. And that's why this 25% that we saw for the derva tramid carried on. Another thing that we brought on in regard to the discussion was the issue of the uh, uh, adverse events that are immune-related. And interestingly, it appears to be that patients with immune-related adverse events, they fared better on the study. And we can see it over here clearly with a quite impressive improvement in outcome. Enough by three years, 36% of patients with immune-related events were doing uh, were, were alive, while 27% without the immune-related. This is quite interesting for us because it seems to heat up the immune system. It appears to be this will transition to benefit. We've seen that described here and there, but we've never seen it actually really implied to an improved in outcome or improved overall survival. So in other words, we should not worry if we see a adverse events occurring that's immune related in a patient. Of course, take care of it, ad adjust it as necessary, but more importantly, anticipate that this is going to actually lead to better improvement outcome of the patient. And this, by the way, of course, carried on based on a temporal pattern. And this is, again, one more time, nicely exemplified over here. Some kind of like prime event which occur exactly as was described many times. This is beautiful data that came out originally from melanoma. But these kind of different adverse events in regard to the immune-related being category or organ-specific, the hepatic kind of like pre-keep up, uh, pre peak up in the beginning, you can see that the colitis might occur at some point also in the beginning, and you start seeing the later on events that occur uh, afterwards. However, more importantly, it appears to be that most of those events with the dervalumab and uh, tremolumab in the stride, which you can see on top of the two panels, really occurred rather in the uh, prime uh, start of the uh, event of therapy, and then you can see at the bottom with the dervalumab alone, pretty much similar kind of uh, uh, finding, but no doubt that the uh, advantage was as translated in what I saw a second, what I showed a second ago, uh, very much translated into improved benefit for this tried regimen that happened. Uh, what else has happened in the uh, last uh, few months? Lots going on. This is nice data that was presented uh, on behalf of the Embrave 150 in regard to the atuzumab plus bevacizumab. And this time they are looking into the updated efficacy. And uh, this is again uh, nicely presented in regard to the improvement in survival as we nicely know it in regard to the improvement in outcome. It's still holding even after the 15.6 month in regard to the overall survival most critically. Maybe a little bit less of a TAD in regard to the progression of survival, understand because progression of survival in regard to checkpoint inhibitors is not necessarily a prime event that we should really focus on quite a bit because of the priming of the T cells that take a little bit longer than what the PFS will translate. Nonetheless, as we can see over here, in regard to the updated data, in regard to subgroup analyses, it's nice to see again one more time exactly what we were just doing in the pre-chat that after all, yes, the benefit was across the board, even though the etiology exactly as expected, Hep B, Hep C will probably fare a little bit better than the non-viral. I will probably be very cautious here to really say conclusions in regard to the numbers because as we can see, we're talking about like literally small number of 
events or patients rather or subjects in regard to the different theology like we have only 72 in hepatitis C and uh, while we have 164 in the hep B. So this has to be really treated with a little bit of caution. The interesting part is that what uh, people ask us a lot about is in regard to the PDL one expression and as you can see it did not matter and actually we would not, and this was done in the Ambrave 150, it was done in the Himalaya study. It seems in HCC specific, this is not a important variable that we need to worry about in regard to the expression, same as we do in gastric, lung, etc. Why is that? Because there's a different kind of mechanistic component of why the checkpoint tubers work in liver cancer. It's already highly inflamed organ with the disease ongoing that's in part of it and especially with advanced cirrhosis and that's why the pd1 expression is not necessarily for that purpose and here we go to kind of like put it all in a nutshell we kind of like quite excited about that we yes we have an amazing now profile of different drugs we have the two tyrosine kinase inhibitor being sorafenib and lenvatamine in first line both are readily available for all of us we kind of maybe have favored the lenvatamine over time simply because of the improved in regard to response improved in regard to PFA, pfs and of course relatively a better uh, adverse events profile in regard to the second line, of course, I defer to Dr. Lee to talk about that. And I would like here to point a very important thing. As much as we are excited and we are talking about so many fascinating things, interestingly, across the world, the most used drug till today for liver cancer is sorafenib. And this is just tell you about especially the limited access that many low- and middle-income countries have in regard to all those fancy uh, options of therapy that are available to all of us. And... Uh, uh, understandably, uh, other events that uh, occurred, and this was nicely updated again at the World GI, is the Rational uh, 301 study, which is the phase 3 trial looking into teslizumab, which is again an NTPD1, which is interesting FC uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, alteration that probably can enhance it further, but compared to sorafenib one more time and looking into outcome. Etiology was, uh, was uh, uh, varied and same time uh, the uh, uh, other requirements or uh, 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 eligible criteria were the same like any other study. As you can see over here, yes, there was an advantage for the teslizumab. As you can see, we did overall survival 18.2 months versus 14.2 for the sorafenib. And we can see that uh, if anything, this was updated for the more than 65-year-old. But still, of course, for the overall population, we have the 15.9 versus 14.1. Now, who are those patients? Why we're doing this? To be fair, this is still in... Uh, Abstract format would like to see more as it comes, but if anything, it will be interesting to remember that etiology does matter. And it could be that we have more of the HEP B patients that we know very well with the control of the hepatitis, exactly as Dr. Lee mentioned, uh, with the treatment can fare better because sometimes they don't even have cirrhosis. Yes, could have contributed to this improved outcome in those patients. Interestingly, though, in that study specific, they again, the subject that we've been touching on a little bit in regard to adverse events and especially the treatment related at adverse events, we can see here that uh, uh, the patients rather fared very well and this compared to the sorafenib. We can see just from the uh, peaks that uh, happened are mostly are sorafenib related, but nicely, we don't have the data. Could it be that, yes, the adverse events that occurred, especially the ones that are immune related, could have enhanced the response to therapy as we just showed in the slide. We don't have that piece of data and lastly, is in regard to the ESMO, uh, Camrizumab plus Tervosanib, fascinating data that was presented by Dr. Shen from Nanjing in China. And this is looking into this combination of, again, one more time, NTPD1 plus ANTVGF compared to Sorafenib. And this study... Uh, looked again at the same kind of, you know, profile that we had in regard to all other trials. But as you can imagine, this trial was heavily loaded in regard to ACC in uh, Asia. And you can see here the co-primary endpoint was actually the PFS part. And you can see ah, a tad a little bit improved in regard to the Kemrizumab Rivosarinib 5.6 versus 3.7 month. But I would say the big news was in the co-primary endpoint, this is a primary endpoint, the overall survival. 22 months compared to 15 for the sorafenib. This is the highest overall survival that we had. However, as I mentioned in the beginning, yes, it's exciting. We're seeing 22 months, but to be fair, 
it really shows two things. Number one, does the combination work? Yes, it does. Number two, does the etiology matter? Yes, it does. This was a heavily loaded Hep B study, and that's why those numbers are coming up to that level. If I add over here the atezolizumab plus bevizumab, when it was looked into a more varied population in the real AB study that's now published from the group in the UK, it showed very clearly that at the end of the day, the immediate survival is about 15 months or so. I would say all three options, camelizumab, rivocerinib, atezolizumab, plus bevizumab, or devrimab, terimab, probably fare the same in regard to when you vary the etiologies. All of them will going to have improvement in survival to get to the HEP-B, and the reduced survival will come to the non-viral. But of course, I, as Dr. Lee said, this is eligible for all patients. I'll stop here, pass it back to you. So a couple questions before we uh, get to your cases. First of all, any other data with uh, IO, TKI uh, that uh, we should be aware of, uh, Gosan, particularly Linbatinib, Pembro? Yep. No, that's great. I was expecting that question, and this is really actually, we'll talk about Linbatinib, Pembro, and talk also about the atezolizumab plus cabozantinib because there are two, right. two cheek points over here. The pembrolizumab plus linvatinib was really a very exciting, highly anticipated study, and guess what? It came negative. Uh, it came with the median survival close to about 21 plus month for the combination of the atezolizumab, uh, I'm correct myself, the pembrolizumab plus the uh, linvatinib, but 19 months for the linvatinib alone. And like everybody, you're like, whoa, where is this coming from? Interestingly, we are waiting for the data in a manuscript format. And all of you say, don't conclude from abstracts. This is really an abstract. It's called an abstract. And if anything, we have to wait for the data. Because it seems that many patients did get, as a second line, checkpoint inhibitors on the lymvatinib arm, per se. And this actually, however, bring in, there was a kind of like almost in parallel, a ASCO presentation, again, in abstract format, that it seems that the sequencing might matter, i.e. if you give lymvatinib first, followed by Pembro, funny enough, it might be better than lymvatinib plus Pembro. We have to wait and see until this pan out in regard to these studies. The other one to talk about, even though it sadly was negative, is the atezolizumab plus cabozantinib. And I would say there were two caveats over here. One of them is that the design of the study with the primary being PFS, as you heard me say before, PFS is not really the prime event that should we worry about in checkpoint inhibitor. But interestingly also, the cancer immunity cycle, as we're referring to, that this NTP2 and NTP1 activity require a kind of a chain of command requirement to really do their job. This can be an anti-VEGF, like in the camelizumab, like in the atezolizumab, bevizumab, but it can be also anti cd 4 all the way in the lymph node, which is the anti cd 4 as we just said. Interestingly, the cabozantinib does not really have a role directly in regard to the cancer immunity cycle, and I would say probably it was a little bit far off, and that's why I probably did not contribute much in that regard to the combination therapy. So a uh, question to Dan. Um, in what situations, if any, would you use single agent IO up front? You know, we hear about this being considered with older patients or a lot of comorbidities. And if you do, uh, which one, even putting aside reimbursement, any preference? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I think that's a great question and everything. Uh, you know, really, uh, where we would use single agent immune checkpoint inhibitor would be like you highlighted. Uh, those patients that are, you know, truly, truly frail. I, I would never use, I would say, chronologic age alone uh, as the uh, criteria uh, for uh, excluding a patient from combination uh, treatment. Uh, and uh, as, uh, you know, Gassan has highlighted, uh, you know, the, the, the stride regimen, uh, you know, just with one dose of Tremi, uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, that's not much, right? And everything. So, so even for those patients that are maybe on the frail, I, I don't have as much of a, a concern of using the stride regimen as a combo in those patients, given the fact that the TREMI uh, is only one dose. Uh, the patients that you really look out for are, uh, you know, do, do they have a lot of liver dysfunction or, or already and whatnot? Because then I'm concerned about uh, when you add combination treatment in that setting, 
the idea that, uh, you know, are they going to develop uh, autoimmune uh, uh, liver toxicity? Uh, we, we know from Stride that, uh, that there was about, you know, potentially 20% of patients that, you know, required steroids uh, in, in that sense. And uh, we do know that single agent uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors would be uh, less. In terms of specifically which one we would use, uh, you know, I, I think Dervalumab is very reasonable given the fact that, you know, Himalaya uh, has that phase three data. Uh, as a single agent immune checkpoint inhibitors. But if you look across the board of overall survival and do cross trial comparisons uh, of uh, dervalumab, uh, tizolizumab, uh, even nivolumab originally from uh, checkpoint 459, even though it's a negative trial, the OS is actually identical, uh, you know, uh, between those uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So uh, really no preference, but given the fact that you have phase three data of non inferiority with uh, dervalumab as uh, Gassan just presented, uh, you know, certainly the raw map makes a lot of sense if you have to use it as a single agent. You know, your point about just the, the one dose of the Tremi is really important. And uh, we had Katie Kelly uh, on the on a program recently, and she was pointing out uh, that, and Gassan, correct me if that, I'm not getting this correctly, that actually the use of steroids with stride was like about 25%, but prior work with Epineva, the use of steroids was more like 50%. So again, getting back to the original issue that this is not Ipinevo. Anyhow, let's just, uh, I'm curious, why don't you present how this 67-year-old woman presented to you, and we'll see what uh, Dan thinks about what he might do with a patient like this. Sure. Yeah, definitely. First of all, I concur. What you just mentioned about the steroid use, absolutely right. And as you already put it up, definitely there was a little bit of a concern because of prior concept about the Ipinevo, but the... Tremi is really, I would say, is like not much of a concern as it was for the epilumab beforehand. Anyway, the case is a 67-year-old lady uh, then with history of morbid obesity and diabetes, history of non-alcoholic steroid hepatitis that was not monitored short of reminder on annual medical checkup that her prime physician was at. She has elevated liver function test. She ultimately developed abdominal pain uh, back in January uh, last year. Extensive evaluation showed evident liver mass with multiple lung lesions. Biopsy, one of the lung lesions showed evident hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, we carry on to... So, uh, we, uh, well, hold on. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, I don't want to give him the answer yet. I want to know how he would <laughs> handle a patient like this. Dan, any thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think this is really where our, you know, uh, practices will be, you know, somewhat different based off of our experience and everything. Uh, so, so normally, uh, you know, with, with a patient like this, uh, you know, we would recommend for EGD evaluation uh, to, to rule out, uh, you know, potential, uh, you know, varices and make a decision in terms of, you know, based off of bleeding risk. All right. So what actually happened, uh, on. So the son who works as a researcher at the pharmaceutical industry heard about a new data called Dervalumab plus Tremilumab. The patient started on Dervalumab plus Tremilumab and added, sorry, uh, at that time the Dervalumab was only available and uh, the Tremilumab was added when it became available. That's an interesting concept because uh, in the beginning Dervalumab was already in the market, Tremilumab was not, so it seems that the uh, patient was given Dervalumab and later Tremilumab was added. Uh, patient has been on therapy since. She's now preparing for her next visit to Canada, Yellowknife, and the Northern Territory, taking advantage of the heat wave encompassing the Northern Hemisphere. Interesting. So uh, I guess uh, it's great that we have two, uh, two alternatives. Uh, uh, let's move on. Actually, I want to get into the issue of later line therapy, particularly second line therapy. I'm very interested to hear what you two think about uh, adjuvant treatment. We have the Embrave 050 and others coming along. So uh, why don't we just jump right into it. Uh, Dan, if you could go through the data. Yeah, sure. So, so I'll break this down into kind of two halves in a way. So first, uh, looking at second and later lying uh, therapy and then uh, emerging adjuvant uh, considerations. Uh, so in terms of uh, second line or beyond therapy, uh, you know, as uh, Gassan have, uh, you know, really uh, highlighted really well, you know, we have options as we discussed uh, in terms of atizolizumab plus bevacizumab, uh, as well as uh, dorolumab plus tremilumab or single agent dorolumab based off the question that you just asked, Neil, you know, uh, in terms of who we would give it to. Uh, and then the TKIs in terms of serafinib and levatinib. But then the question is, you know, what do you do for your patients after they progress on frontline therapy? 
And I would say, you know, overall, the uh, there's, uh, you know, in terms of interactions between the current first line as well as proposed second line treatments are mostly unknown because most of our second line agents were approved in an era where they were tested after serafinib. Uh, and not after these other agents. Uh, and certainly, as we've been discussing so far, there's no definitive biomarkers that uh, that we know of that can really accurately predict for patient response to the various different types of HCC treatments. So there's been several different thoughts. Uh, you know, one is to essentially take your original first-line TKIs, whether it's serafinib or lymvatinib, and use them after the immune checkpoint inhibitor combinations. Uh, or go directly to the prior second line uh, approval treatments. Uh, there are certain things to kind of keep in mind. Uh, one, if, if you look at the second line treatments in terms of rigorafenib, rigorafenib from the resource trial was really done for patients that could tolerate serafinib. So that might be a consideration to think about if you are going to choose rigorafenib as a second line setting. Uh, for remesuramab as a monoclonal VEGF, uh, targeted therapy. Uh, this was really done for patients that have uh, elevated AFP. Uh, so AFP defined as greater than or equal to 400. Uh, and that's really where the approval is uh, because uh, that's what the REACH2 study showed that it was this population that derived a uh, benefit uh, compared to placebo after serafinib. Uh, and then pembrolizumab has accelerated approval. Uh, I would say that, you know, if a patient got Already, uh, immunotherapy in terms of PD-1, PD-L1 immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, probably would not use uh, just another immune checkpoint inhibitor alone in the uh, second line or second line plus setting. So it would really be for those patients that are naive. And then nivolumab and ipilimumab has also has accelerated FDA approval uh, in the second line setting post uh, serafinib. Uh, so this could be considered, and I'll show, share some of the data from this uh, ASCO that was looking at that population as well. And then certainly we have cabozanib from the uh, Celestial trial that uh, Kassan led, and, and that did include patients that also did have uh, prior immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, therapy, uh, uh, despite that it was a small subset of patients, but there is that data. So cabozanib certainly can be considered in the second line setting or even the third line setting uh, as well. So... Um, you know, this just shows you kind of the current second line treatments in terms of regorafenib uh, based off of the resource trial in terms of uh, improvements in PFS as well as OS uh, compared to placebo as well as cabozantinib and rivacermab that we mentioned about. So all of these are really viable options. Uh, and then the challenge is really deciding how do you sequence these uh, treatments given the lack of data and what do we do going forward? Um, so at this at years ASCO, that there were some interesting abstracts, uh, and, and certainly too many to cover, uh, but I picked uh, a few just to highlight here in terms of different concepts that we're looking at. So if we're thinking about using the prior first-line treatments and everything, uh, I think we can all agree that, you know, serafinib and lymvatinib certainly does still have a role, and as uh, uh, Gassan mentioned, we probably would favor lymvatinib. Uh, just because of the higher objective response rate, uh, as well as uh, a progression-free survival uh, advantage uh, numerically that has been larger. Uh, what we don't know is what is that objective response rate truly in the second-line setting post atezolizumab plus bevacizumab, uh, as well as post uh, dorolumab plus tremolumab. Uh, we think that, uh, that there's been some small retrospective analysis that shows that the objective response rate is uh, you know, somewhat lower, uh, anywhere between, you know, maybe 8% all the way up to, you know, 13 or 14% congregates based off of, uh, you know, several retrospective analysis. Um, but I think this abstract was very interesting uh, in the sense that it's looking at, you know, can we combine something on top of lymphatinib? Uh, and in essence, you know, use this as a possible second line treatment going forward. So this study, uh, by Dr. Akita and colleagues, uh, looked at a molecule called E73A6. Uh, so what E73A6 really does is that it blocks the interaction between CREB binding protein uh, that's involved in the beta-catenin pathway, uh, and it modulates the WEN and beta-catenin uh, signaling. And we know that certainly this is a pathway that is involved in uh, HCC pathogenesis, uh, and that's the rationale behind targeting it. 
So the investigators were able to essentially combine this molecule plus lymphatinib and, and show that there was, uh, you know, certainly based off of this waterfall plot, uh, a uh, encouraging preliminary signal in terms of anti-tumor activity. What was even more interesting was that there were even patients that were previously uh, treated with lymphatinib uh, that got this agent, uh, and still three out of the 11 patients uh, in those patients that previously had lymphatinib had a response. So, so, so potentially this could be a rescue medication or could further heighten the efficacy of lymphatinib uh, in this setting to potentially prevent possible resistance mechanisms going forward. Um, so the second abstract uh, to kind of highlight is kind of the real-world data analysis of the known kind of second-line agents that we have. So regorafenib, as I mentioned, is a uh, uh, FDA-approved second-line agent uh, for HCC. Uh, and here, uh, uh, you know, previously Dr. Finn had reported on this, and then uh, Dr. Kasev had an abstract at ASCO, which showed that, uh, you know, in the real world, uh, there was, you know, somewhat differences in uh, dosing of regorafenib in the second-line setting, uh, that most of these patients uh, did require uh, additional dose reductions uh, compared to the clinical trials as we uh, expected. You know, for a lot of us that have used regorafenib, we know that sometimes, you know, tolerance is an issue. Uh, but interestingly, um, it, what was interesting is that sometimes practitioners will upfront dose reduce uh, in order to allow their patients to tolerate treatment. Uh, but the investigators found that there was a median OS that was longer in patients that started at the full dosing of regorafenib, of 160 milligrams per day, compared to those patients who had upfront dose reductions. So I think we have to really look at this in the sense of, you know, how do we optimize dose of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors in our patients? We certainly don't want to harm our patients with too much toxicity, uh, but we also don't want to necessarily underdose our patients, uh, and then as a result of that, uh, lack somewhat in terms of uh, efficacy. Uh, and then the final concept is, you know, should you use I.O.? after prior IO regimens in the frontline setting. Uh, so this is a uh, study that was uh, presented by the Hopkins group uh, along with uh, other investigators looking at this idea of using nivolumab plus ipilimumab after prior immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Uh, so here they looked at, uh, again, uh, relatively small cohort of patients, 32 patients, uh, but they received various different types of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor combinations. 50% uh, of the patients received atezolizumab plus bevacizumab. 31% uh, of patients received other VEGF plus immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and then 19% of patients received uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy. And what they saw was that they saw, you know, uh, somewhat of a uh, modest uh, but reassuring uh, response in terms of objective response rate of uh, 22%. Uh, one of the things that I, I found was, that was really interesting with this study was that the investigator said that all patients who had an objective response to Nevo-Ipi had not had an objective response on prior anti-PD-1 or pd one treatment, which was somewhat counterintuitive to the other retrospective analysis that we saw last year as well as earlier on this year, where they thought that, you know, patients that had inherent resistance were the patients that were not going to necessarily do well on nevo ipi, which is what this population that the investigators are highlighting, but rather that those patients that initially had a response and then developed acquired resistance, those were the patients that were going to respond. So I think what this is now telling us is that we have somewhat conflicting data, that the objective response rate in this you know, post-IO population is probably anywhere between 15 to 20 percent. Uh, but what we don't know is, should we be going after those patients that have just primary resistance, or should we be going after those patients that actually have uh, acquired resistance uh, going forward? Um, so there are several ongoing trials that are looking at, you know, various different types of questions in the second line beyond setting, you know, post-IO treatment. So Embrave 251 is looking at the idea of continuation of uh, checkpoint inhibition with atezolizumab plus uh, frontline tyrosine kinase inhibitors, whether it's lymphatinib or serafinib now being used in the second line setting versus uh, serafinib or lymphatinib alone. Uh, and certainly our colleagues that are part of the accrual network is uh, also looking at this question with continuing now atezolizumab with either cabozanib or lymphatinib uh, versus cabozanib and lymphatinib alone. And then there is this question of, you know, nevo ipi uh, post atezolizumab, uh, bevacizumab that I've highlighted, uh, you know, before as well. 
Um, so, you know, for, for, for kind of the second half, we're, we're going to look at, you know, uh, kind of considerations for those patients that have resectful HCC. So uh, at AACR this year, as well as uh, we got an update at ASCO this year, uh, was the uh, Embrave 050 study that was looking at the role of adjuvant atezolizumab plus bevacizumab. So these were patients that had a confirmed HCC diagnosis that was going to undergo curative intent surgical resection or ablation. They had to have high risk of recurrence, uh, really defined uh, by the fact that they either have a, a fairly large tumor, greater than five centimeters, multiple tumors, microvascular invasion, uh, minor macrovascular invasion uh, in terms of VP1, VP2 uh, disease, uh, as well as potentially poorly differentiated tumors. So, so grade three or grade four on pathologic uh, diagnosis. Uh, and for those patients, after either surgical resection or ablation. They were randomized to receive atezolizumab plus bevacizumab up to 17 cycles of treatment versus uh, active surveillance. Uh, and the primary endpoint of this study was, was recurrence-free survival. Uh, so these are the baseline characteristics. And as you can anticipate from a large phase three global study, uh, the treatment arms were relatively well balanced uh, in terms of ethnicity, uh, uh, ECOG performance status, uh, PD-1 uh, expression. Uh, majority of these patients uh, did have hepatitis B. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, well above 62% of patients had hepatitis B, uh, whereas other patients, uh, including hepatitis C, as well as non-viral ideology, were uh, included as well, abates, uh, you know, relatively at a lower threshold. And we understand that uh, because, you know, the hepatitis B patients uh, usually tend to maybe possibly have a slightly more uh, indolent tumor and everything. I can't get to that, you know, time of uh, surgical resection. Uh, and in terms of BCLC staging, uh, most of these, uh, as you would anticipate, would have BCLC, you know, stage A disease. Uh, these are the curative uh, procedures that they had. Um, uh, majority of patients, uh, above 87% of patients, uh, they had surgical resection. Uh, some of these patients uh, did uh, have uh, adjuvant taste uh, following uh, uh, resection. This is uh, something that uh, typically is done uh, in our Asian countries, uh, including China. A lot of our Chinese uh, colleagues, uh, you know, will do this uh, as part of their, uh, you know, adjuvant treatment. And certainly for a high-risk population, we might understand why they would do that. Uh, and then there were about 12% of patients uh, that had uh, ablative uh, therapies as well. Uh, this is the uh, primary endpoint. The study did meet its primary endpoint in terms of recurrence-free survival. So adjuvant atezolizumab did prolong recurrence-free survival compared to active surveillance. Um, I didn't include overall survival because the the, the, the study is uh, relatively immature in terms of uh, long-term uh, follow-up. Uh, but the study does allow for crossover. So those patients that were on surveillance, if they develop uh, recurrence, uh, they could then go on to receive uh, additional treatment with uh, tezolizumab plus bevacizumab. So most likely there will not be a uh, overall survival uh, benefit because of that crossover role. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, overall safety, uh, it is really kind of consistent with what we've seen with the atezolizumab plus bevacizumab uh, regimen. Uh, common AEs that were observed are no AEs for this regimen, whether it's proteinuria, uh, hypertension, uh, some mild increases in uh, liver function in terms of AST, AST. Uh, the grade five events in terms of arms uh, for the atezol, uh bev arm, there was one case of uh, esophageal varices uh, hemorrhage uh, that was related to the atezol bev and one case of ischemic stroke related to the bevacizumab. So these are no bevacizumab uh, toxicities. And again, uh, really highlight, uh, you know, doing a good history on your patients in terms of understanding their comorbidities, as well as the fact that we need to do the EGD to minimize any risk of uh, uh, bleeding uh, from the uh, regimen itself. Um, the uh, patient reported outcomes were also reported at ASCO this year. And what you can see was that what was reassuring was that there was no significant difference in terms of all the various different types of quality of life domains between the patients that received the adjuvant atezolizumab plus bevacizumab versus the patients that were on just active surveillance. So, so this, this is, you know, really assuring that, you know, even going after a treatment in the adjuvant setting, uh, that they did not necessarily have a deterioration in terms of quality of life, uh, in that sense. Um, so I think what is the future? The future is that we're going to have a lot more questions. Uh, the question is really going to be, 
is single agent immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy enough in the adjuvant setting? And we can potentially get clues with these ongoing trials that, you know, should be reporting out pretty soon, uh, whether it's Checkmate 9DX, which is looking at nivolumab versus placebo or Keynote 937, which is looking at pembrolizumab versus placebo. But what is probably the most intriguing study to me will be Emerald 2 because of the fact that it has three arms in the study looking at the combination of dorvelumab plus bevacizumab versus dorvelumab versus placebo in the adjuvant setting. And that should really be able to tell us whether or not we need combinations going forward or is single agent immune checkpoint inhibitor in the adjuvant setting enough for our patients. Uh, so then the final consideration is the, the, this idea of neoadjuvant immunotherapy. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of thought that, you know, as our systemic treatments have gone better, can we potentially downstage our, our, our patients and get them to, you know, potential curative liver transplantation? Uh, however, previously the concern has been either graft rejection, uh, or potential recurrence. Uh, if you look at a literature search of uh, some of the patients that uh, went on to receive prior neoadjuvant anti-PD-1, PD-L1 immunotherapy followed by liver transplant, what's seeing is that, you know, potentially rejection has occurred in 11 out of 45 uh, patients uh, and recurrence occurred in 2 of 45 patients. So about, uh, you know, 25% of our patients, you know, potentially can develop uh, rejection. Now, the uh, uh, issue is that there has been different lengths of the neoadjuvant uh, immunotherapy that was given, different lengths in terms of the washout period prior to transplantation, uh, and different uh, expression, you know, potentially a PD-1 or PD-L1 in the uh, donor tissue and what they received as, you know, a post-transplant regimen. So all this uh, really has to be considered. Uh, there was this abstract at ASCO this year that's looking at the uh, stride regimen that uh, uh, Dr. Abu Alpha mentioned. Uh, and now it, the investigators are looking at the stride regimen uh, as a total of a, uh, a four-month regimen as neoadjuvant treatment prior to liver transplant. Uh, and, and the primary outcome is to look at treatment failure up to 30 days post-transplant. So this will be very interesting to see whether or not, you know, we can give these patients neoadjuvant combination uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and can they have a safe transplant? Because if so, then this could potentially be a strategy that we consider to help our patients and potentially get more patients on transplant for curative intent for their HCC moving forward. Um, so uh, there are also other ongoing trials. Uh, so, so these are predominantly in Asia. So there's a trial that's looking at lenvatinib plus pembrolizumab, as well as lenvatinib plus dorvolumab as neoadjuvant immunotherapy for patients, uh, you know, prior to liver transplant. So certainly a lot of exciting things on the horizon uh, in, in this field of adjuvant, uh, neoadjuvant uh, setting uh, to potentially help our patients to be cured of HCC uh, going forward. So uh, thanks a lot, to, uh, Dan. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I always keep an eye on cool uh, names of trials. I like the name Plenty for a trial <laughs> name. Anyhow, I think maybe a good way to get some input from uh, uh, Gassan will be to go through your two cases. Also, I note I noted there, even though it was only one case, you know, the uh, grade five uh, variceal bleed and the adjuvant trial. I mean, some of these people are cured. I'm not too many, I guess, but uh, it's interesting they had a grade five event. All right, so Dan, why don't you present uh, the, what happened with this uh, 84-year-old? We'll see what Kassan would do in the second-line setting. Yeah, so so the, uh, the, this is an 84-year-old gentleman that we had, a uh, history of hepatitis B, uh, had abdominal pain, uh, comorbid medical conditions include type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, uh, chronic hep B. Uh, CT imaging showed a large lobulated 6.8-centimeter uh, mass in the medial inferior right hepatic lobe extending medially. Uh, to or are actually originating from the right adrenal gland uh, with a possible invasion to the IVC. Uh, there were also several satellite uh, liver lesions that were noted. Uh, liver biopsy was consistent with moderately to poorly differentiated HCC. Um, so uh, patient underwent EGD, no uh, esophageal varices, uh, otherwise uh, child pu A. Uh, so uh, interesting to see what, you know, G G you know uh, Gassan would do and everything. I, I think we all know what I would do, but, you know, uh, uh, also would see what, you know, Gassan has to say. Well, uh, so this patient uh, progressed uh, on Atezo, Bev, uh, Kassan. What do you usually think about in that situation? Two questions come up here, and if Dan can help us, uh, how long after 
progression after treatment, three cycles, uh, which means uh, probably give and take about like two months, correct? Yeah, so, so for atezolbev, they were after three cycles of treatment, they had a uh, radiographic response. Yeah. With okay. the shrinkage, and then nine cycles of treatment, there was Got evidence it. of disease progression. Got it. Yes. Yeah, the only reason I'm trying to stress out when did the recurrence happen. In that setting, by all means, uh, the school of thought that probably will adopt the most is to change to a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and probably lymphatinib, where we kind of like, you remember the theory that I brought up back in 2020, is that we call it line minus one for the checkpoint inhibitor doublet, and then we still use the first line tyrosine kinase in that setting. Uh, so uh, that probably would be an appropriate choice uh, in regard to where you go from there. Uh, add to this, I will add that uh, in case, and that's why I stressed it out, in case the, recur the uh, progression happened very early, a anti-drug antibody probably could have played a role in that regard, and I think the patient will still be eligible for another choice of checkpoint inhibitor. In other words, if the adizubav that you insisted on not work, I think I'll try the dervatrami. So this is a kind of complicated case, and maybe you can just sort of summarize. I know the patient did go on a TKI, serafinib, uh, some complications, and progressed, then ipinevo, interesting, uh, disease progression, but stable in the liver, gets radiation therapy, ends up on cabozantinib. Anything you want to say about the case? And uh, well, there's the other case. We we'll, might we'll be able to get to that. Any yeah, thoughts so, so, about so this it, case? It's really what, you know, Kassan said, you know, we, we, we moved on to, you know, first line, uh, you know, TKI therapy, whether it's, uh, you know, serafinib or uh, lymvatinib and everything, we felt that, you know, maybe the patient might not be able to tolerate, uh, you know, lymvatinib, uh, you know, too well and everything. Uh, so, so we gave serafinib and then uh, did, didn't necessarily have a long-term uh, response and uh, develop progression. And then we, we, we went to uh, Nevo Ipi because of that, uh, you know, accelerated approval uh, in that setting of, you know, post serafinib. Uh, you know, certainly I think, you know, Durva Tremine could be considered uh, if you can get the approval and everything. And then eventually when they, uh, you know, ha had somewhat of a longer durable response as well and then develop progression, we went to, you know, Cabo Zandif, given the fact that there were, uh, you know, prior data in terms of post IO with uh, Cabo as well. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's just, it, it highlights the journey that we're now in for HCC patients, that they have a lot of options, even after first line. And the ideal question is, you know, really, how do you sequence this, you know, going forward? Yeah, I think you've moved from a trip to a journey. You're exactly right. And uh, hopefully in the future, that trip will be even more exciting. So I want to thank uh, both of you, uh, Gassan and uh, Dan, for uh, sharing your experience and doing these presentations tonight. Audience, thank you for attending. Come on back Monday, same time, same place. We'll see what Dr. Shure and Dr. Taplin have to say about localized non-metastatic prostate cancer. I'm kind of wondering whether LHRH agonist by itself is going to be going away with all these new intensive regimens coming in. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Kassan. Thanks so much, Dan, for having us. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, Dan. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye.